Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for another town hall. I'm really excited to be here uh, with you all tonight to give you an update on all the work that we've been doing in Washington and here in Minnesota in our district office um, and uh, get into some of your uh, questions later on. Uh, but I wanted to do something different tonight. Um, I wanted to start by sharing a little about what the um, off, what our office uh, actually does. And so we're going to have our um, uh, case manager, Nikki, uh, join us and give you all um, just a run through of everything um, our office can help you in regards to constituent service. Nikki, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be joining you on the live stream tonight. Uh, great. Awesome. So I think our um, comms person is going to add uh, a little bit of our slideshow on the side here. Um, so as the Congresswoman mentioned, um, uh, my name is Nikki. I'm the uh, Constituent Services Director here in her Minneapolis office. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit about the um, casework that our office does, um, some common issues that we help constituents navigate, what the process is, and how you can get in touch with us. If you want to move on to the next slide, please. Um, so first question, what is casework? Um, in short, casework is how congressional offices provide an extra layer of oversight, accountability, and redress um, when federal laws are being applied. Um, we can help on individual cases when the issue is about how that law is being enacted, administered, applied, rather than when the issue is with the, the language of the law itself. So like the main question is, whether this is a, an issue that can be solved through a process within a federal agency, or whether it's something that needs to be changed in the law so that way people aren't put in the situation in the first place. Um, sometimes the, an issue can be both things, but in general, this is like a pretty good framework to, to be able to determine whether or not uh, our office might be able to help you out with your issue. Next slide, please. So um, when can we help? Uh, there's two main things that uh, will need to be true in order for, um, for one of our caseworkers to be able to assist you. Um, so first of all, you must uh, live in, work in, or else have strong ties to Minnesota's fifth district. So um, here's some examples of, of what we would consider a constituent. Um, the first one would be like a person who goes to college out of state, but their permanent address is in Minneapolis. Um, in a second instance, uh, a person lives in Minneapolis um, but their father is the one who is subject to federal action. In this case, let's say it's a, a deportation because the impact is going to be falling on, on our constituent here in Minneapolis. We'd be able to, to contribute to, um, to that person's case. Um, another example, let's say a person lives in Plymouth, but the issue is impacting their business, which is in St. Louis Park, which is in the 5th District. That's something that we'd be able to, to also help out with. Um, Secondly, you need to have uh, an issue with the federal government that is currently under consideration. So um, we'll get a lot of questions about like, what sort of immigration application do I submit? Or like, can you help me review my application, make sure that I filled it out correctly? Unfortunately, those are not issues that we're able to help with. Um, we can only really step in when, the, when uh, it's a pending, when there's a pending issue already under consideration with the government. So like once you submit that immigration application, if there's some other mitigating circumstance, um, talk a little bit about those in, in a minute, um, we, can, uh, we can help you out with that. Something like a denial of a social security claim, um, being unable to get a response from an agency on unemployment. Those are things where you have like an active thing in front of the government that they can respond to specifically. And in those instances, we're able to help. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when can we not help? So if you don't have a pending application or a pending issue, uh, unfortunately, there's not something that we can inquire about. Um, we can, in some instances, ask for like guidance from an agency, but in general, um, casework is when there's a specific issue and we're gonna try to fix that one specific issue. Um, if there's no mitigating circumstance, then uh, we don't really have an avenue or a process um, to be able to navigate with you um, to change what's happening. So um, for instance, a lot of immigration applications take a long time to process. If you're experiencing like financial loss or you're gonna maybe lose your job because of a, a delayed application, there's like a humanitarian circumstance, 
those are all things that are unique in your circumstance that could help us be able to get your case processed more quickly. However, if the issue is just that it's taking a long time, but it's not causing a sort of emergency situation, unfortunately, we're, we're not usually able to help in those instances. Um, I mentioned earlier, if there's an issue with the way a law is written, we can't ask the federal government to, to break the law when they're trying to administer the law. Um, but we do want to hear about those issues so that our team in Washington can work to change those laws so that you and other people are not put in those situations. Um, if an appeal period has closed, um, we can always ask the agency if there's a, a, a way to reopen that appeal timeline um, and, and allow you to submit that for consideration. But um, if the process has already been offered to you and, and you were not able to do that for whatever reason, um, uh, unfortunately, those are things that are difficult for us to be able to, to help on. Um, if you're not a constituent or if the issue is purely a state or local issue, please uh, feel free to contact us anyway. We can always connect you directly with another office or depending on what specifically is the issue you're experiencing. If it's something that could set a dangerous precedent for our constituents, the Congresswoman will always want to be able to contribute just to make sure that, um, that our government is setting up precedents that are going to, um, to work to the benefit of everyone in our district and in the country. And then if it's a state or local issue, um, we can always connect you with the local partners. Or as you can imagine, the federal government has its fingers in basically every pie imaginable. And so uh, we can always uh, connect you with, um, we, if we can't take on the case our, yourself, ourselves, we can connect you with the appropriate office who's gonna be able to do that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what are the common casework issues that we take on? Um, so immigration is far and away the, the biggest area that we help our constituents. Um, and a lot of the cases that we help on are expediting applications, either due to severe financial loss or due to a human humanitarian circumstance. So for instance, if, you, if your work permit application is pending and you're missing out on a job opportunity or you may lose your current job, um, that is grounds for us to be able to get your case expedited pretty, um, pretty simply. Um, if you need to get a travel document in order to be able to visit a family member who is, is very sick or, um, or uh, to attend like a funeral procession or something like that, those are also grounds to get those applications expedited. Um, similarly, if uh, your case has been pending for a long period of time and you don't know what's happening with it and it's outside of standard processing times, please check in with us. We can inquire about the case. Lately, we've seen um, our Citizenship and Immigration Services Office approving applications and then sending them to a warehouse rather than sending them to the next office that actually finalizes stuff. And so it could be that your case is already approved. They just haven't, they, they just don't know it because it's not filed in the right place right now. Um, we've been doing a lot of cases on unemployment, a lot of cases, especially in the last few weeks about delayed refunds or third round stimulus payments um, or issues with uh, like, let's say your tax account has flagged you as deceased or has uh, an incorrect name. It's Trans Day of Visibility today, and we've helped a number of um, trans people uh, ensure that the IRS is not gonna dead name them on their financial documents um, and that they're sending through the mail. Um, so if you have issues with the IRS, um, please get in touch with us. Um, if we can't help you personally, we can get you connected uh, with the information that we'll be able to help you. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, the last couple issues, so social security issues. So if you have like denied payments, uh, uh, denied benefits or payment reductions, um, small business issues. So like if you have an application with the Small Business Administration or to check on the, the forgiveness status of your loan, um, uh, please get in touch with our office. Um, issues with healthcare, um, either buying it on Minsure, Medicare coverage, anything in the healthcare realm, um, please reach out to us if there are issues that you think we might be able to help with. Um, and so in short, uh, I like we can't guarantee that we're always going to be able to fix your issue, um, but uh, we will always give it our 110% effort. Um, we will uh, do anything possible to uh, to either get that, that favorable outcome from an agency, get you connected with somebody who's going to be able to help, or else get you um, the information you need so that you can plan your life accordingly if the federal government is not going to be able to accommodate your specific situation. So. Um, uh, if, if, you, uh, ha if you have any questions, you can reach out to our office. Um, please check out the Congresswoman's website, omar.house.gov. Our privacy release form is on there, um, as well as our direct contact information. Um, uh, and with that, I will wrap up my comments today and give it back to uh, the Congresswoman for your regularly, regularly scheduled town hall.
<laughs> well, thank you uh, so much, um, Nikki. We really do appreciate uh, the work that you and the rest of our staff does on behalf of our constituents here in the fifth. Um, and uh, and I hope that uh, people have gotten an idea of everything that we can help them with. Um, and maybe that means a little more work for you, uh, which is really exciting. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. All right, so I wanted to start um, by sharing a little bit about what the House uh, and um, Congress in general has accomplished uh, since my last town hall in February. As many of you know, Congress passed the America Rescue Plan and it was signed into law earlier this month. Uh, that is a $1.9 trillion um, investment uh, that included uh, some really core priorities. Um, we uh, were able to have $1,400 stimulus checks out to people, $350 billion for state and local governments. We were able to um, expand uh, unemployment by $300 uh, dollars, uh, in unemployment benefits, um, $160 billion for contact uh, tracing and um, for vaccine workers. Um, we have been able to get $130 billion to help K through 12 schools reopen safely. So our children are able to go back uh, to schools and schools that are doing hybrid have the resources that they need in order um, to uh, juggle some of the challenges they're having. Um, we expanded the foreclosure moratorium until September 30th. Um, and uh, provided an additional $30 billion in rental and utility assistance. Um, we were also able to get $5 billion uh, in uh, support for uh, homelessness uh, and working towards ending homelessness. We also just learned that CDC um, has uh, announced the federal eviction moratorium would be extended through the end of June. Um, this will help protect millions of tenants who have been struggling to make their payments during this pandemic. Earlier this month, our um, uh, nation um, suffered through two mass shootings within the same week. Um, our heart goes out to every family and community uh, that has been touched by this, specifically the communities in Atlanta and Boulder um, who have been impacted directly by these uh, tragedies. Um, as a result of, of these events, the House was able to pass two pieces of legislation to help strengthen our uh, nation's gun laws. I was so uh, pleased and happy to be able to co-sponsor both of those pieces of legislation. HR 8, which is our Bipartisan Background Checks Act, and HR um, 1446, the Enhanced Background Checks Act, um, also known as the Charleston Loophole. Um, it is really a long overdue uh, that we uh, pass these pieces of legislation into law to, continue, to prevent tragedies like this from ever happening again. If you um, live in a state um, where your senator is not supportive of these pieces of legislation, please contact them because these pieces of legislation have not uh, been voted up and down uh, in the Senate yet. Uh, the president has signaled support um, and it is uh, time to get it to his desk so that we can um, have him sign it into law. Uh, we were also able to pass in the House the uh, Violence Against Women's Act earlier this month. This legislation um, is a much needed uh, legislation that will help make um, investment in domestic violence prevention. Sadly, one in three women is still experience domestic violence in our country and the pandemic has forced many women to quarantine in unsafe domestic situations. Um, 
the bill uh, included three of my amendments that would better track the economic consequences of domestic violence, um, which we were really excited about. That bill also is still waiting to be heard uh, in the Senate. And so we ask you to call and advocate um, for it to, to move through the Senate as well. And lastly, I wanted to give you all an update on some of the legislation that um, we passed that I highlighted in my last town hall, um, HR 1 uh, for the People Act that would expand voter access, uh, ensuring a stronger and more exclusive uh, system for all. Um, we know that uh, there is severe threat um, out in, in so many uh, estates um, to people who are getting their voting rights uh, challenged. Um, and so this piece of legislation really is an important piece of legislation that will help uh, expand people's access to the ballot box. We were also able to pass the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act that addresses police misconduct, racial bias, uh, excessive force in policing. Um, and I had the honor of presiding over the um, floor uh, doing the um, voting uh, for that piece of legislation. Next, I'd like uh, to inform you all about some legislation we have introduced in my first three months. Um, we reintroduced the Paul Act that would strengthen the Foreign Registration Act and make sure lobbyists representing foreign countries act in good faith and operate with full transparency. Uh, that piece of legislation was included in HR 1 um, and, uh, and it was able to, to pass the House. We also um, introduced the Rent and Mortgage Cancellation Act that would be a national, nationwide cancellation of rent and mortgage payments through the duration of the pandemic. Uh, it would instead uh, create a fund with HUD that would uh, help pay um, uh, landlords and um, uh, mortgage holders. Um, we've also introduced the Zero Waste Act and End Pollution Welfare Act to address the climate crisis. Uh, and just this past week, we introduced the Healing Act that would um, set aside $11 billion within the Community Development Block Grant Program for, for historically disinvested um, communities. So if now, if we move on to um, highlighting some of the uh, events and activities that we've been able to partake in uh, in the last month, um, we had the ability to visit a once in, um, in, a, in a lifetime program that um, is being, has been started here in, in Minnesota. Uh, we were able to stop by the Avivo Village. It's a tiny homes community shelter in Minneapolis. Uh, that is working to end homelessness. Um, we uh, got an opportunity to see how they were able to utilize some of the CARES Act uh, resources um, that we released back in last March um, to be able to, to create this tiny homes community um, that currently has about 22 um, people who have experienced chronic homelessness, um, and it has the capacity to house over 100 people. Uh, and their work really is about um, getting uh, these community members into stabilized housing. And we look forward to um, seeing other communities adopt similar uh, models um, in, in our effort to end homelessness once for all. Um, we also got an opportunity to get a tour um, by the lead project managers at the Met Council for the Blue Line extension uh, and stopped by some of the significant stops where the routes would go through to bring accessibility to the Northwest Metro, specifically um, the accessibility that would be created um, for communities in, in North Minneapolis. We also had the pleasure of visiting three schools uh, in my district this month. Um, we visited two virtually, and yesterday I got to go into one in Robbinsdale in person. Um, we had an uh, opportunity to meet uh, fourth graders at Park Terrace Elementary in Spring Lake Park. Um, the uh, amazing uh, second graders um, from Lucy Laney Elementary School in North Minneapolis. 
Uh, and then um, the one that I mentioned uh, in um, uh, in Crystal, uh, not Robbinsdale, but Crystal Neal Elementary, um, where we were able to also meet uh, the uh, superintendent of the Robbinsdale Public School District to discuss the recent funding that they um, have received through the American Rescue Plan and how they're implementing that as they uh, think about um, planning their, their summer program to help offset um, some of the in-schooling missed opportunities that our children have faced. Um, we uh, also got an opportunity to uh, visit Roots Community Center. Um, they are doing some really amazing work uh, over at North Side, uh, North Minneapolis. Um, they are the only black owned uh, and operated birth center in Minnesota and one of only five uh, in, in the country. Uh, and we got to witness the birth of um, a baby girl. So that was really uh, wonderful. And lastly, I would like to highlight my travel to the Southern border to meet with refugees and asylum seekers with uh, Representative Castro and other members of Congress. Um, the children that we were able to meet there um, uh, provided a reminder for us that um, the situation at the border and uh, the children that are coming to our border shouldn't be um, politicized and we shouldn't be playing games uh, with, with their lives. This is about children, um, some as young as toddlers who have been forced to flee unspeakable violence in their countries and deserve to be treated with basic humanity. Uh, some of the children that we spoke to were still traumatized. Uh, many of them feared for their lives in, in their uh, home countries. Some have lost family members to violence. Uh, and um, there are um, they're here because they are seeking asylum. Um, and looking for a shot at the American dream. Uh, a lot of them have family members here already that they're looking to reconnect that they haven't seen and have been separated from for a really long time. And so to me, this really is a, is a reminder that um, we have a moral and legal, legal responsibility um, to, to provide that opportunity uh, for, for these kids. Um, and it's also the ethical thing to do um, this is an issue that's very uh, personal for me and um, and will continue to push this administration uh, to keep their promise of uh, treating these these children um, humanely. the the images that we are uh, seeing in in um, in some of these uh, uh, border um, uh, holding centers, um, these um, you know, places that they're keeping children uh, really are, are horrendous. Um, it's unacceptable uh, and we should not lit up um, our, our outcry uh, and our demands um, for there to be a humane treatment of, of these children. And now um, for the remainder of the time, I would love for us to get into some of the questions that you have sent in um, and some of the questions that are uh, still coming in. Um, one of the first questions we have received uh, is, what are you doing to address the recent hate um, uh, crimes uh, towards the Asian community? Um, we have seen uh, an uptick in anti-Asian uh, incidents in the past year, mostly against uh, women. It's important for us to remember that an attack on one of us uh, is an attack on all of us. Uh, historically, minority communities have um, been pitted against one another. The model um, minority myth uh, that keeps us apart is rooted in white supremacy. It's an idea that continues to divide communities rather than unite. Together, we must denounce all forms of uh, white supremacy and bigotry and misogyny and patriarchy um, and you know capitalism that um, helps uh, fuel um, some of the hate that we are seeing in, in our communities. 
That's why I co-sponsored uh, Representative Grace Ming's resolution to condemn all forms of anti-Asian hate. Um, I'm also co-sponsoring Representative Raja Krishna Murthy's uh, bill, um, the Hate Crimes Commission Act of 2021, to study the rise um, and stop hate crimes. Uh, in order to make our community safe, we must stand in solidarity together to fight against racism and hate um, and not target one another. And today, you know, we were able to have a press, press conference. We were joined by leaders of the um, uh, AAPI uh, community. We were also joined by um, uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Peggy Flanagan um, and uh, leaders of the Native American community, um, leaders in within the Jewish community. Um, uh, so grateful for Representative Frank Hornstein um, and City Council Member um, Steve Fletcher uh, for joining us. Um, today is also uh, Trans Visibility Day, um, and so our dear friend, City Council Member Philippe Cunningham, also joined us to um, at, at, for the press conference to speak about um, how hate towards one community um, is is uh, really a, a signal that there is hate in in many communities, and we have to do this work um, together. We were also joined by Representative Samantha. Um, Vang and uh, County Commissioner um, Irene uh, Fernando, um, who are both members of the AAPI uh, community um, and who spoke of their, their own experiences and the work that they are doing um, in, in fighting back uh, against um, hate within their own communities. But by and large, um, as uh, elected uh, officials, you know, it is important that we see um, the the intersectionality um, of of the hate that that we are all experiencing, uh, and how we can work together to root it out. Um, our next question um, asks what's happening on immigration and what we are doing to help asylum seekers at the southern border. Um, Last week, uh, the House was able to pass the Dream and Promise Act, which would offer a pathway to citizenship for DREAMers, TPS holders, and DED recipients. Um, sometime in the next few months, we hope to have more clarity on what will happen with President Biden's more ambitious immigration bill which I think we're calling it the Citizenship Act, which will help provide a pathway to citizenship for millions of undocumented people in our um, country. None of these bills are obviously comprehensive or perfect, um, but they will help um, us get us towards a, uh, they help us take a step towards um, uh, creating that that path um, in in the right direction uh, to to eventually get it right. Um, I'm working in uh, close collaboration with other progressives <laughs> in Congress to improve them. Um, at uh, you know when we're giving the the opportunity to do so um, once these bills are uh, moving um, in in the House. There's a lot of moving parts, especially in uh, the Senate. So I can um, I am not able to offer a clear timeline on uh, when some of these bills uh, will become law, uh, but we'll continue to uh, push. There is lots of energy um, within the Democratic Party around moving significant immigration bills in this Congress. And I believe this is um, the time when members of our community, uh, like those of you who are joining us today, uh, should help us push um, by making phone calls um, to other representatives in your area and senators um, so that we can help pass these bills into law. Um, we also need a coordinated push to ensure these bills are improved um, and don't contribute to the criminalization of immigrants. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing from all of you on uh, what some other priorities are around immigration that we should be uh, thinking about. So 
while I may not be able to fully uh, tell you what the vinyl versions, versions of, of these bills will be, um, I can tell you that we're going to be working really hard um, to uh, make sure that these bills get done as soon as possible uh, and to make sure that they are the best bills that we can um, pass in, into law. Um, as an immigrant, uh, I know um, how just broken our immigration system is and how much work uh, it's going to take um, for us to, to fix it. Um, let's see, um, what is happening with, uh, the third round of stimulus payments is our next question. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, Congress included a third round of stimulus payments in the American Rescue Plan. Um, this time payments of $1,400 will be sent to adult dependents, which is a major expansion from the first two rounds. Um, that uh, is um, a really big win um, for all of our communities. The IRS has made good progress for millions of Americans, but I know that many are still waiting on theirs. Uh, and so um, if uh, you have not received yet, uh, as Nikki said earlier, um, our office can, can help uh, with, with that process. So don't hesitate um, to reach out to us. Um, the Social Security Administration for weeks didn't um, send the IRS account information for people to get their um, Social Security. Um, and that's why over 30 million Americans are um, have waited four weeks to get their stimulus checks uh, this time. Um, Congress has stepped in and got the Social Security Administration to release this data within 24 hours and payments have been uh, able to um, go out. Uh, you're, um, you're able to check the status of your payment by using IRS's Get My Payment tool. Um, and you can go to irs.gov. Uh, and it's the first link that you see when you um, go on there. If you can't get the status of your payment through the IRS website, um, you can again contact our, our office and our staff um, will help uh, assist you. One thing that I forgot about who is eligible it's, it's, is that mixed status families um, are also eligible um, for the first time to receive the stimulus checks. Um, we're also helping uh, work with um, people who are experiencing homelessness uh, in accessing their um, checks. So if uh, you know someone um, who needs support, who might not have access to to this live stream. Um, please contact them with our connect them with our office so that we're um, able to to help them. Um, okay, what type of funding did the K through twelve education system receive under the American Rescue Plan Act? Okay, that's a really good. Um, question and that's what some of our visits um, in in the district have been about with different school districts lately. Um, when uh, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan earlier this month, the um, U.S. Department of Education announced um, the estimated amount of local education agencies the LEAs uh, under elementary and secondary school uh, emergency relief fund that um, each state, uh, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia will receive. The funding will give schools the resources they need to reopen safely for in-person instruction and address the significant impact um, the pandemic uh, is having on the um, students' education and their well-being. The state of Minnesota is estimated to receive 1.3 trillion, a little, a little over 1.3 um, trillion uh, dollars, specifically for K through 12 education. The public school districts within my congressional district in CD5 
um, will receive about 235 million. Each local educational um, agencies that receive funds would be required to reserve 20% of their allocated funds for activities to address learning loss to the pandemic. Um, and one of the school districts that we visited, the Robbinsdale School District, um, was talking about how they are expanding their summer school programming from serving one third of their students in a traditional year to serving all students within the school district. So that's how they're um, utilizing uh, their, their funds and helping address the, the learning loss. Um, that has been due to the pandemic, which is really um, exciting. Uh, what type of funding was allocated towards housing is our next question. Um, as I've said earlier, the American Rescue Plan um, had a little over uh, $40 billion um, uh, in, in regards to support for housing, $27.5 billion. Um, of that money went to support renters during the pandemic. The funds were authorized for emergency rental assistance programs, new emergency housing uh, choice vouchers, housing counselors that provide services for those in foreclosure and eviction mitigation, the Indian Housing Block Grants Program and the Indian Community Development Block Grants Program to help Alaska Natives, Native Americans, and Native Hawaiians with pressing housing needs with, uh, during the pandemic. Five billion um, went to support people who are experiencing homelessness through the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. This funding will enable state and local uh, governments um, to finance housing and health-related services for the homeless, including acquisition of hotels and motels to serve as transitional and permanent supportive housing. Um, 10 billion um, to support homeowners during the pandemic to address the ongoing need of homeowners uh, by providing direct financial assistance for mortgage payments, property taxes, property insurance, utilities, and other um, housing related costs. 20 billion, uh, 20 million um, to uh, support fair housing. These additional resources will be provided to community housing organizations to address fair housing um, inquiries, complaints, investigations, and education and outreach activities doing or related to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So there is just a lot of um, support in uh, in regards to housing. If you are um, in need, uh, get in touch with your local municipality, with your state, um, with housing agencies, with advocates. Um, there should be uh, support for you. Many of the rental assistance um, that's provided uh, could be backdated all the way to March. Um, specifically here in, in Minnesota, I don't know about other states, but in Minnesota, um, you can get um, assistance for rent uh, that, that you missed all the way back to the start of, of the pandemic. There's no limit to the amount uh, that is paid out. Um, and so there, and there are no caps um, in, in regards to uh, the amount of rent that will be uh, paid. So um, that's more flexible um, and uh, helpful than some of the stuff that we've been able to do um, with previous packages um, under the last administration. Will K through 12 students continue to receive um, meals as we transition into the summer? That's a really good question. Um, this month, uh, USDA Food and Nutrition Services announced the um, extension of several nutrition nationwide um, uh, waivers that will allow all children to continue receiving nutritious meals um, this upcoming summer when children are um, out of session. 
the waivers are under the um, current uh, uh, authority um, uh, Congress provided uh, in the Families First um, Coronavirus Response Act. The extension um, was previously set for uh, June 30th, um, 2021. And it's now available through September 30th, 2021. Um, meals served through summer food service programs um, and seamless summer option programs are to be made available in all areas at no cost. And many of um, these meals programs are available to children and their uh, families um, for pick up uh, now and um, uh, through the summer. Um, another food related question, are SNAP benefits going to increase? Um, the US uh, Department of Agriculture announced earlier this month a 15% increase in um, SNAP benefits through uh, September. Uh, this provides an estimated $3.5 billion to households experiencing food insecurity during the pandemic. 15% increase in SNAP benefits will uh, provide about $28 um, dollars more per person per month and more than $100 more per month for a household of four in addition to their... Um, SNAP benefits. Uh, the bill also funds um, partnerships with restaurants to feed American families and keep workers in the restaurant industry um, on their uh, jobs. Okay. Um, Is there an update on the increased amount um, for child tax credit? Um, that's also a really good question. There will be an increase in the child tax credit from uh, $2,000 per child to $3,000 per child, um, $3,600 for a child under the age of six, uh, and um, make children who are um, uh, the age of 17, um, a qualifying uh, child for the year. Uh, this will certainly make a difference for um, families of more than 1.1 1. Uh, 1 million uh, children here in, in Minnesota, in our, in our state. Um, and so that's a, a really, um, big and exciting part um, of the American Rescue Plan. Um, and it is um, set to, to help uh, really cut child poverty um, into half. So it's, it's um, really an exciting uh, development and something that um, we were able to, to get in the American Rescue Plan. Um, oh, this is... This is a fun question. Uh, will we be hosting the art competition this year? Um, yes, we are. Uh, we certainly are um, hosting the art competition this year. I am um, excited uh, to be able to host my third um, congressional art competition this year. The national competition has been held since 1982, which is the year I was born. Uh, selecting um, virtual art from every U.S. House district uh, for display in the U.S. Capitol for a year. The theme for this year's um, uh, CD5 art competition is connecting across isolation. This year, I encourage students to think about how um, they have been able to find community despite their usual, uh, this, despite this unusual circumstances. Um, what does connection through isolation mean to you? This competition is open to all high school stu students who are attending uh, school in Minnesota's fifth district. The deadline to submit 
Um, your artwork is Friday, April 23rd by 5 p.m. Um, and for more information, uh, please reach out to our office at mn.info at mail.house.gov or 612-333-1272. All right, we have a question about um, vaccinations. How can people get vaccinations? Um, as of this week, uh, as of today, actually, all Minnesotans over the age of 16 are eligible to get vaccinated. The governor has directed healthcare providers to still prioritize those who are at high risk for COVID-19, the elderly and those with specific health conditions. Um, and essential workers. Uh, there are still many people who um, want a vaccine, then there are vaccines available. Um, so if you are healthy and able to work from home, um, we hope that you'll be patient and you'll allow uh, those who are more vulnerable um, uh, to get vaccinated ahead of you. Um, I have been able to get my vaccinations. I've gotten both of my dosage. Um, I felt a little uncomfortable in uh, being a pri in, a, in a priority category uh, when Congress was um, put ahead of everyone. Uh, and I waited until uh, many in, in my own community was able to, to get um, uh, the vaccine available to them. Um, and so uh, now that um, availability has increased and many uh, of those vulnerable in our communities have been able to, to get theirs, I've um, decided to get vaccinated and, and help share that with people so that they know it's safe and um, accessible and necessary part of us fighting against uh, this, this pandemic and um, going back to um, having some normalcy in, in our lives again. Um, if you haven't signed up for the Minnesota Department of Health Vaccine um, Connector at the vaccineconnector.minnesota.gov, um, they will email you. Um, uh, you. You can go there and um, sign up. Uh, and they'll be able to email you and let you know if you've been um, selected for a vaccine through the uh, state system. You should also make sure that you have a MyChart account through your health provider. That's another way to get connected to vaccinations. Many pharmacies in the area are also taking appointments um, like Walgreens, Hyphy, Cup, and CVS. Uh, so we hope um, that you will be um, uh, able to to utilize all of all of those connections um, in and uh, and get yourself vaccinated and help connect to those in in your community um, who might not get this information from me today uh, and learning a little bit more about how they can access that vaccination. Let's see if we have any more questions coming in. Oh yeah, so this week um, is Infrastructure Week uh, and um, we are uh, just learning um, the details of the uh, administration's infrastructure um, plan. Um, I am uh, excited um, to, to see uh, you know, some of the things that are being proposed in, in the plan um, and uh, really applaud the administration um, for continuing to propose solutions to the deep challenges we face as a nation, uh, mobilizing the country to address the climate crisis, confronting centuries of systematic racism and creating um, millions of good paying uh, jobs, uh, which are really essential um uh parts of uh of um of our our democracy but i believe uh that you know it's important for us not to waste this historic moment um in addition to some of the proposals that the president laid out uh we must use this moment 
to dramatically um, lower the um, uh, cost um, of drug prices, expand um, Medicare to millions of people, um, make sure college is affordable, um, strengthen the care economy, provide a roadmap to citizenship, um, you know, address the housing crisis that we have, uh, and make sure that there is a bolder investment that's being made um, in creating uh, green jobs. Um, I think the um, American people are uh, really ready um, for uh, us to go big and be bold um, in in this particular time, and um, and you know we're going to continue to push the administration to to go big and be bold. So keep sending in your questions. Okay, that's a that's a really um, good question. What are uh, what is our foreign policy to help stabilize Central America? Central American countries so that people aren't forced to flee their homes in the first place. Um, you know, I, I, I think we as a nation um, have a choice to make. Um, we can um, double down on the um, cruelty of the Trump administration that falsely um, fans the flame of hate against immigrants, or we can show basic humanity and tr treat the root causes of um, uh, migration in the region. Uh, that means ending um, a cruel foreign policy that arms the very state actors um, who are fueling the migration crisis. It means investing in civil society groups uh, and multilateral um, multi um, entities that can bring stability in, in the region. It means protecting the safety of migrants who are forced to flee and giving them a righteous and fair path to citizenship. I often hear so many people say, you know, get in line. Um, and many people forget that we have actually dismantled <laughs> the line. Um, we haven't really had uh, a functioning system um, where there is a proper line uh, for um, people to um, access um, immigration and seek um, asylum within our borders. Um, we have zeroed out the number of refugees um, we are uh, bringing in into our country. Um, we've messed up the family reunica reunification processes. Um, we have messed up the process of seeking asylum um, and have turned our back on our own laws uh, and international laws that protect the rights of migrants and refugees. Um, and you know we have allowed um, for uh, policies within um, Central American countries to exist uh, where people are um, living in in violent situations that we helped create um, and um, are dealing with um, you know, impunity. Um, from state actors uh, and law enforcement that we have trained and armed. Um, I've seen this with my own eyes when I went to Honduras years back. Um, we have allowed uh, uh, our companies to go into um, and uproot indigenous communities um, uh, for the sake of investment and development. Um, and there, there is a lot that, that we have to do. And I don't know 
um, if the um, the plan right now that that exists with the the vice president um, and and the task force uh, that she's going to um, lead uh, is to to actually address all of that, or it, if it is just to have. Um, a conversation with the leaders of these countries on how to actually stop um, people from coming in because I don't think unless we address why people are leaving, um, we we should be telling people that they can't leave um, because people are living in in really unsafe um, situations and we have an obligation um, to uh, help. Uh, those who are exercising their international right um, to seek asylum. Are you, um, let's see, are you going to attempt to lower the Medicare age to six years old? Um, yes. So, uh, along with um, Bernie Sanders and the Progressive Caucus, we have been fighting um, to make sure that the Build Back Better uh, plan includes and um, an uh, expanded um, an expansion of uh, Medicare, so that more people are able to access um, quality health care. You know there is a big fight um, we have undertaken uh, um, in uh, advocating for Medicare for all uh, in, in Congress. You know, it was a piece of legislation that had at, at one point, not too long ago, only 30 members as co-sponsors uh, within the Democratic Party. And now half of the Democratic caucus um, is on that piece of legislation, uh, but we have a long way to go um, before we can uh, get um, everybody uh, on board uh, and, and have the ability to pass Medicare for all, because we know essentially that is the most important piece of legislation that we can pass as members of Congress. Um, and it's going to take, <laughs> a lot of um, work to convince the rest of our, our caucus to, to be able to, to say yes and then to, to get it through the Senate um, and find um, a friendly administration that will sign it into, into law. Uh, and in the meantime, because we know that you know, so many people are living with the pain um, of of not having healthcare uh, in in our country, um, that we have to, we must do everything that we can um, in in uh, getting getting them the resources that they need. So we'll continue to um, do that. Let's see. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, are oh is there any news on student debt cancellation um the biden administration um recently uh expanded the moratorium on um student loan interest and collection um and canceled student debt for 40 um, 1,000 borrowers with disabilities. These are, I would say, um, very welcomed changes, um, but they don't go as far enough as we need them to go. Um, I have been uh, calling on the administration to fully cancel student debt. Um, because we know that is a, a, a really wise economic policy um, to, to engage in. Um, we've let uh, a letter with Senator um, Senate Majority Leader 
uh, Chuck Schumer and Senator Elizabeth Warren um, and um, Ayanna Presley uh, in, in the House um, calling for a significant cancellation of $50,000. Um, the president has the ability to do this with just the stroke of a pen, uh, and I hope he does that. Um, we know that the president has said um, that if we send him a bill of canceling $10,000, that he will sign that into law. Um, but having legislation go through Congress um, that we know might not have the ability to pass through the Senate um, is basically saying you're 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 not going to be you're not willing to do anything, um, and so we will continue to pressure him to use his executive order um, and his executive to use an executive order with his executive power um, to to cancel um, student debt because it is a, a really important legislation. Um, it's really important policy. Uh, so many Americans desperately need um, that relief. And um, the, the legislative process at, at the moment doesn't support it because we don't have um, mem yeah, enough members of, of Congress um, and enough members in the Senate um, who will vote even canceling 10,000. Um, and so we uh, have to continue to pressure the, the president to, to be able to, to do that. Um, and so I know uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator um, Elizabeth Warren has, had just released a video asking everybody to make a call um, to uh, the administration asking and urging uh, and demanding um, the president uh, cancel um, $50,000 of student debt. Uh, and so I hope that you all are um, hearing that call and will flood um, their uh, phones to be able to, to get this, this done. Um, and with that, I, I just wanted to say um, thank you all for uh, joining. Um, you know, these um town halls are not as fun and as engaging um as they would have been if we were in person uh together and we could have follow-up questions from you um and and really actually address uh some of the serious concerns and questions that you have um and it just feels like there's a there's a barrier uh to us communicating about some of the things that i'm working on um and some of the things that you uh care about that you want us to to prioritize and to work on um and so i'm hoping uh soon um maybe with warmer weather we can do this outside and in person uh but i i really do miss the the ability to be in a room uh, with with folks um, to to do this, uh, and so as many of you know, we do our coffee and kulan conversations as well from the um, official side, uh, and so I hope you will uh, join us for those conversations. Um, there are less of an update um, and and less uh, about a you know general topics, um, more about really getting uh, deep into um, uh, policy discussion uh, on a piece of legislation that's either moving here in Minnesota or um, on a federal level uh, that that we you know do get the opportunity to discuss and break it down uh, for you with other champions um, who are carrying the mantle for for that piece of legislation. It's an honor to represent you. It's an honor to um, go to Washington every day to fight on your behalf. Uh, and I just feel humbled and thankful uh, and honored um, to, to get the opportunity to do so. So don't hesitate to reach out to our office because our office is your office. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you next month for another town hall. Bye, everyone.